now, next thing I want to do. We're going to take the story that we just told and we're going to tell it again in a slightly different context. And I'm going to tell it in the context of what economists call or have come to be known as game theory. All right, so game theory is setting up an interaction between individuals and describing it or depicting it much like you would describe a game. It could be a card game, a board game, whatever. We're referring to those particular types of games. But now we're going to tell the story more in terms of a game, so to speak, that's being played by the brother and the sister in this particular market situation. Right? And we're going to describe their actions and behaviors or potential behaviors in terms of a game and see what we can come out from that. Okay, so let's do it. So assumptions. First, let's consider a game between two players, and we're going to let the two players be firm A and firm B. Now, we're going to assume that each firm has two strategies, and this is like, you know, in a game, you always have choices that you have to make, and the choices can be very complicated, but here, the choices are actually quite simple. We're going to imagine that the choice a firm has is how much to produce and supply to the marketplace. But as we know, each firm's production level is going to be affected and, and their outcome is going to be affected by what the other person does as well, just like in a regular game. So what I do in the game is then going to be responded by the other players in the game who are going to react and try to do what's in their best interests to achieve their particular objectives. All right. So. Let's assume that each firm has just two strategies. Now, in actuality, the firms have many strategies because they can choose any output level they want from zero to you know, a very high level. But we're going to simplify the story here to just two discrete choices. The firm can either choose a, a quantity of 2.5 or they can choose a quantity of 3.5. Now, we could expand this. You know, we could make the diagram go out further and we could say, you know, what if it was 4.5? What if it, and we could make this much bigger? But all the essential points are contained within these two simple choices. So we're going to do it uh, in this way. Now, lastly, we're going to assume that the payoffs, the numbers in the boxes, represent firm profits. And we're going to imagine that the firms care about their profits. That's what they're motivated to do. So what does success in the game mean? It means getting as much profit as you can, uh, making as much money as possible. So that's going to be the objectives of the individuals in this game. Now, notice that I've got firm A and firm B listed up here in the upper left-hand side of this box, this figure. And that's going to mean that firm A's numbers are going to correspond to the upper diagonal in each box. Firm B's numbers are going to correspond to the lower, below the diagonal. This box here, giving a payoff for the two individuals, is going to be what arises when firm A chooses 2.5 thousand diamonds to produce and firm B produces the same okay then each of them are going to get 12.5 million dollars in profit so we can put an M here and a dollar if we want okay so that's 12.5 million dollars and, and where do those numbers come from well they come from this figure back up here right the 2.5 and the 2.5 12.5 and 12.5 so we're getting the numbers from the example that we used before Let's do the same thing and figure out the numbers for all the other circumstances. So what we did is imagine that firm B at first increases their output to 3.5, but firm A stayed at 2.5, in which case we end up in this lower left box. We saw that firm B's profits go up to $14 million and firm A's goes down to $10 million. If we reverse it symmetrically, we let A be the cheater at first and B stay fixed, then we're going to get a reversal of the of the profits. A is going to make 14 million, B is going to make only 10 million. And then lastly, what happens if they both jump to 3.5 thousand diamond production? Then we're going to end up down here on the lower right, and profits are going to drop to 10.5 million dollars each. All right, so that describes four different outcomes that are possible to arise in this particular simple game where the brother and sister can choose either two and a half thousand or three and a half thousand diamonds to produce each period. Now, first thing I want to do is to define what's called a dominant strategy. 
A dominant strategy is the best choice that one can choose and it will arise regardless of what the other person does. And in this particular game, it's such that there is a dominant strategy for each of the individuals. It can be found like this. We could ask, what is firm B's best choice? Should they pick QB equals 2.5 or 3.5 if they knew that firm A was going to choose 2.5? So let's do that exercise. Firm A chooses 2.5. What should firm B do? Well, firm B has a choice between 12.5 and 14. Clearly, the 14 is a better choice, higher profit for B. So if firm A were to choose 2.5, this is going to be the choice of firm B. Choose 3.5. All right. Now, let's forget that. Suppose instead firm A chooses 3.5. We could ask, if that were the circumstance, what's the best thing for firm B to do? Well, now firm B has to choose between 10 and 10.5 because we're imagining firm A is doing this. Firm B can choose either this or this. Well, 10.5 is the best strategy. It's going to give them the higher profit. So this, again, is the best choice for individual B. It turns out that it doesn't really matter what firm A does. The best choice for firm B is going to be to set a quantity of 3.5. And that, for that reason, it is the dominant strategy for individual B. Nothing else is better than that. Always choose an output of 3.5. That's what firm B should do. Now, if we reverse this, and if we said, let's suppose that we do it for firm A instead, in that case, you're going to say, well, let's suppose firm B chooses 2.5. What will firm A do best? Now, firm A's outputs are here, and they're going to compare 12.5 to 14 because firm A can choose this or this, assuming this. But that's the best choice for firm A, right? 14 is better than 12.5. So if firm B chooses 2.5, firm A is going to choose this column right here. But what if firm B doesn't do that? What if firm B chooses 3.5? Well, now firm A is going to choose between 10 and 10.5. Again, 10.5 is better. Again, this is the best strategy for firm A. Always choose 3.5 output regardless of what firm B does. Now, when there are two dominant strategies, and this doesn't always happen like this, if we adjusted the numbers, if we have a different kind, we end up with a different kind of game. And I want to emphasize that this is just one type of game that can arise. It does arise in our circumstance, but it can look differently too. Now, in this particular case, the non-cooperative equilibrium is going to be the dominant strategy for each of them. And it's also called a Nash equilibrium. All right, now that name, Nash, comes from the economist or mathematician John Nash. And I'll point you to the movie, which many of you, I'm sure, have seen, B-E-A-U, Beautiful Mind. That's a movie about John Nash, and that's whose name is associated with this particular equilibrium in this game, a Nash equilibrium. It's also called a non-cooperative equilibrium because each individual is assumed to just do what's in their own best interest and to ignore what the other one is doing, or well, kind of. Uh, it has to take into account what the other is doing, but it's always going to be just focusing on its own profitability. That's all each person cares about. And that's what it means to be non-cooperative. And this is how we arrive at a Nash equilibrium in this particular game. It's in both of their best interests to choose 3.5 thousand diamonds as their output level. Now, this outcome, this Nash equilibrium down here is called a prisoner's dilemma outcome. And the reason for that is these two individuals acting in their own best interest have chosen an outcome which is clearly inferior to this one up here for both of them. You know, we can just look at this game now and say, well, wait a minute, why would they, why are they both led to choose 3.5 thousand units and both end up with $10.5 million in profits when I can see right here on the diagram that there's something that is better for both of them. There's a better outcome for both of them, and yet they don't choose it. Now, the first thing that I want to highlight is that this is actually a pretty interesting outcome in and of itself, because it's showing us something that contradicts what we had said before. 
in economics. We said that if individuals pursue their self-interest, right, and they maximize their profitability in the marketplace, that that's actually going to lead to the improvement and well-being of other people as well, right? And so that profit-seeking was a win-win situation. But here we see that profit-seeking is actually leading to a worse outcome for the individual profit-seekers themselves. That's the dilemma. Why do they end up choosing something that's not in their individual, kind of their joint best interests over there? Right? And that's, that's surprising. And we have to ask and think about why that occurs and also how to get about it or how to get around it. Now, the way to get around it is found in the, an alternative equilibrium concept, an, inter, an alternative outcome that can come about in this model. Suppose the two individuals cooperate, and we know what that means in this context. It means they get together and they form a monopoly, and they make a joint decision about how much to produce themselves. The cooperative equilibrium, first of all, in definition, is going to be the outcome that maximizes joint or total welfare, profits in this case, for the individuals. I should actually put profit here, probably. They don't want you to confuse this with consumer welfare. We're not considering that at all in this particular example. If we look at total profit, we're going to get $25 million here, right? And we're going to get $24 million here and here. And we're going to get uh, $21 million here. Ask, what's the best outcome in terms of joint profit? It's going to be this one right here. That is the cooperative equilibrium. Right? That's going to be where they ought to move if they could cooperate with each other. And cooperation means form a cartel or collusive agreement. Both agree to limit their output to 2.5, raise up their prices from 6 to 8, and as a result, increase their individual profitability. So cooperation is the collusive or cartel arrangement that we were talking about before. And it is the best outcome for the individual firms to make. But in order to achieve that, they have to cooperate. They have to talk to each other. They have to collude. It is not the best outcome for consumers or for market welfare. That best outcome is down here in the Nash equilibrium. So when we talk about this in terms of the game, we're thinking about it just from the perspective of firms. What's best for the firms is not what's best for the market overall, and it's not what's best for consumers either.